Hi, and thank you for joining us again on Decade News. My name is Brittany Hayward, and today we are going to be talking about the 70s. On this week of Decade News, we are going to be looking at Bruce Shulman's book, The 70s. The points that we are going to cover within this episode, number one, I'm going to present my own thesis of the 70s. Number two, I'm going to identify and critique Shulman's book, and then I'm going to say whether or not I agree or disagree, what points I agree with, and what points I disagree with. Number three, I'm going to be mentioning what I believe the most important themes of the 1970s were. And then number four, I'm going to discuss the connections between the 1960s and the 1970s. While reading and watching documentaries about the 1970s, I realized that it reminded me a lot of the 1960s, as in the beginning of the decade was drastically different than the end of the decade. I believe that the 1970s was actually a progressive continuation of the 1960s in many ways, such as the feminist movement, the civil rights movement was continuing, um, gay rights movement, and then also in a difference in music such as disco and punk rock. I feel as though the people of the United States and their beliefs and their attitudes at this time was greatly dependent on leadership. At the beginning of the decade, Nixon was president and due to scandals such as the Watergate scandal, the people of the United States began to lose trust in the government and the leadership that they were under. But towards the end of the decade, they had someone like Jimmy Carter to rely on, which unlike Nixon, he was very, he had small town values and he actually walked during the inauguration down Pennsylvania Avenue in order to show the people that he was with them. In this book, Shulman states that he believes that the 1970s, the range is actually not 1970 to 1979. He believed that the 1970s, the decade, actually started in 1968, and he believed that it ended in 1984. The reason he believes that this particular range is credible is because he says that there was a remarkable makeover between 1968 and 1984. In the preface of this book, he says, it is easy to mock the overall chronologies that lay such heavy weight on years that end with zero. But during the long 1970s, 15 malaise and mayhem filled years from 1969 to 1984, the United States experienced a remarkable makeover. Its economic outlook, political ideology, cultural assumptions, and fundamental social arrangements changed. Do I buy Shulman's idea that the 1970s began in 1968 and ended in 1984? And his idea that there was a complete makeover during this time and that's why it ended, a so, ended so long? and that it was greatly dependent on diversity? Some of it, I believe. Some of it, I don't. I am what he considers one of those people who hang on zeros. I believe that each decade is a chapter that goes into the other one that the events that happens in 1970 is greatly dependent on what happened in 1960. The events that happened in 1970 should not determine when the decade actually ends. This does not mean that the movements that occurred during the 1960s either changed or evolved once we got to the 1970s, um, especially like the feminist movement where in the 1960s it was about um, the women wanting to be equal and have equality, you know, compared to men, but this time it is the women who are wanting to um, be recognized as a woman and be able to get actual jobs outside of housework. And it said that about half of, or about half of the marriages ended up in divorce 
during this time. And something else that he mentioned was actually, um, it's called the me decade. And I do agree with the me decade. Um, he was saying that during this time, people were um, having a sense of self and they were self-examining to see like who they were inside. And due to this, people felt like they had more power and could make a change where um, there needed to be. Due to the idea of this me decade and self-examination and self-studying, um, many people felt empowered because they recognized themselves as something more than just a person, but they were a person from a, either a different culture or a different age frame or, you know, just a person in general. So a lot of people were greatly affected by this because due to this power, they um, began protesting and they felt like they could make a difference, such as, you know, the, the student protests against the war. But in the end, um, like in Kent State, troops were sent over to open fire in order to stop these protests, so they were punished for this idea of discovering who they really are. Shulman focuses a lot of his time on talking about the political aspects of the 1970s, such as um, Nixon's presidency and the Watergate scandal and then he also goes into some details about the power of the Sun Belt. Concerning Nixon, there's actually two sides of the story. Some people believe that he was wanting to make the decision in order to help the overall good of the Earth and people within it. And then other people say that he was a tricky dick in a sense. So, um meaning he would just make decisions in order to help himself out and didn't really care about the people. And also concerning the Sun Belt, which was an issue with capitalism, they had a superiority at this time and there was a big boom. And at one time people thought it was going to be the second war between the states. Um, but the Sun Belt location, it actually goes from like California all the way through Arizona, Texas, and now it's all in the southern states. And because Nixon was such a California man that um, people began to think that maybe he started to become advantageous in that area. I have about four main themes that I have picked for my uh, favorites of the 1970s that I feel have a very important impact. Um, these four, actually, I feel, even though four doesn't seem like a very big number, um, they very they connect very well in the angle that I'm going from. So my themes that I feel like that the most important are, well, the civil rights, which the movements that include gay rights, civil rights, um, the feminist movement, um, the student protests, and that also involves like the, the feeling of self and self um, trying to find who they really were. And that all kind of goes in one. Um, I feel another theme would be um, the music. So the two main music of, um, genres at that time were um it was disco and punk rock and I feel like both of those genres actually they make a point you know one they were escaped from everything that was going on at that time um and then another it's just like the 1960s when the people who were listening to the music during that time they were in the rock and roll they were considered rebels well the people listening to disco and doing the punk rock you know they were considered you know kind of rebelling too but at the same time it wasn't technically rebelling it was actually you know just discovering themselves and finding another avenue of um expressing themselves so, and then my third one would technically be kind of on the political side of it, but the, the leadership of the people. Um, at the beginning, Nixon was president, and by the end, 
um, Jimmy Carter had completely turned things around. Um, he even tried to, you know, get the people involved by having a meeting whenever all of this discrimination and everything was going on, that um, he had a meeting with a group of people of who a very diverse group of people and got their opinions, which is called the the Malays. And um, he actually, in his next speech, he used examples from what almost each and every individual had said and how they shared. And it kind of helped, you know, it was the connection between the president and the people, which Nixon never had. The last theme that I have chosen that is important to the 1970s is a little bit different than my other ones. It's actually the economy. I, after doing a lot of research, I realized that during this time, people were producing, you know, cars, and especially in Detroit, you know, that was a big, you know, selling point for them, and they were making a lot of money, and that's kind of how people were able to get their American dream at this time. You know, people were able to move past this whole idea of having these cookie-cutter houses, and they were able to buy their own house that's different than everyone else's and buy their own car. And during this time, the economy was kind of going up and down. And eventually, due to the oil industry, you know, across in the Middle East, that had a very negative effect on the states. And this negative effect actually made people think of, you know, they had to think differently because there wasn't enough fuel and gasoline to go around. So people were either waiting in line to go, you know, get the fuel or they would have to wait and get it some other time. It completely changed their way of life and they had to learn how to buy and sell and spend their money efficiently. I found a I believe it's a journal article from the University of Pennsylvania Press, uh, written by Elizabeth Tandy Shermer. It's called The Sunbelt, Capitalism, Phoenix, and the Transformation of American Politics, which I found very interesting because now that I'm living in the Phoenix area, I didn't realize that before this class that the Sunbelt was actually more than just, you know, the southern like Georgia and Florida. It's actually all along the bottom of the United States, which includes California and Arizona and all of those other states. So I found that really interesting. But um, in this article, she actually, she focuses on the 70s, but she actually focuses on many other decades as this, at the same time. So it proves that this Sunbelt has not had an advantage, but has um, been really good at um, their capitalism tactics. So, all right, right here it says... Shermer traces the modern conservative revival in America back to the economic conservatism of Barry Goldwater and his fellow businessmen, not to, to just the racial and anti-communist groups that coalesced around his 1964 campaign or to the social and cultural tensions of the 1970s. So it does say that it has social and cultural tensions and that they were having it racial. So that's how it's like backing um, up the showman, but if you follow this down, she mentions that few Sunbelt cities burned brighter or contributed more to the conservative movement in Phoenix. In 1910, 11,000 people called Phoenix new home. So um, even back in 1910, um, this area, and so Shulman had an, got this idea, not just for the 1970s, but for even previous years before that. This next article is actually a book written by Kelly Boyer Saggart, and it's actually called The 1970s. And the actual um, part that I read was the main synopsis about the book, and it was actually quite interesting because I won't read the entire thing, but um, I will um, point out certain points that um, Shulman really emphasizes that's backed up by this as well. So um, 
right here it says a fresh or the fresh anguish of the Vietnam War, the disillusionment of Watergate, the regression in the oil embargo, all con contributed to an era of social movements, political mistrust, and not surprisingly, rich cultural diversity. It was the me decade, a reaction against 60s radicalism reflected in fashion, film, the arts, and music. And songs of the Ramones, the Sex Pistols, and Patti Smith brought the aggressive punk rock music into the mainstream, introducing teenagers to rebellious punk fashions. So just in that little paragraph, it reiterates a lot of the stuff that I said and a lot of the stuff that he said. So I found it quite interesting on how the me decade was not just about finding themselves but it actually directed them in a way to express themselves through fashion film arts and music this last book that i chose is called how we got here in the 1970s by david frum and the particular reason i chose this one is because this particular small paragraph kind of just backs up the entire book that Shulman says and his idea of the makeover. It says, the real conundrum to be explained is not why American loosened up, but what, why that loosening happening, happened when it did. Why the 1970s rather than post-Cold War 1990s? Why did it take the abrupt convulsive and often hysterical form that it did rather than proceeding slowly and gradually as the World War II generation cleared the scene. The answer can be summed up in three words, Vietnam, desegregation, and inflation, which he covers all of those in his book, which I didn't talk a whole lot about the war and um, I knew it was very important, but um, those are definitely covered in this book and it totally backs him up 100 Before we wrap up this episode of Decade News, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between the 1960s and the 1970s. Although they are only a decade apart, the fact that Farber in his book that we covered last week talks mainly about commercialism and consumerism and um, about the marketplace and the 1970s according to Shulman is that it's very different than in 1960s and there's a particular paragraph that I'm quickly going to read right here it says even important elements of the radical 1960s left embraced and trammeled free enterprise as a sure path to personal liberation and social uplift many ex-radical saw starting their own businesses and inventing their own products as a way both to free themselves from the cookie cutter conformity of corporate life and to advance their political objectives. So they realized that it wasn't all about having that cookie cutter way of life like it was in the 1960s. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Decade News. Next week we'll be talking about the 1980s. Can't wait to see you then. Have a good night.